Aloha, and welcome to another edition of Condo Insider, Hawaii show about association living. As I've said many times, about 40% of our population lives in an association here in Hawaii, and this show is all about information for board members and owners. Some have said, why do I have a flower lay on today? Well, I had the chance to be a guest speaker at the Hawaii Council of Community Associations seminar today at noon on reserve studies. And so those of you who are interested in more education, check out Hawaii Council of Community Associations. They have a very vibrant program on education for homeowners and condo associations. Finally, 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 we're at the final chapter of HRS 514B, Hawaii's Condo Association, something that began as a four-part series. And we're now in the part six of the four-part series because it was so robust. And the material for this course, uh, this class, comes from uh, the uh, Real Estate Commission's course for realtors on condo living. And I want to welcome back my good buddy and good friend, Scott Shirley, Director of Training for Associa, who's helped me go through this, who's been qualified by the Real Estate Commission to teach this course, and say welcome back. Well, thank you. I, I know you tried to lock the door, but I still got in. Yes, I yeah. noticed that. <laughs> and I know you're leaving today, but I'd like to tell everybody that Scott is a very skilled uh, person who had his own radio show. He's going to be joining me and Jane Sugimura as a future co-host on the show, and we appreciate all that you're going to do, and your jokes will never be as good as my jokes. Well, we we'll let you believe that. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, this show is all about condominium 514B, and we've been through government structure, government process, fiscal matters, financial budgets, reserves, and we've been through common issues, and last week we got through half the common management issues, <laughs> and because we have these 28 minutes go so fast, we're going to roll right into the condominium issues we face today, and the number one thing, and it's always a big challenge, is pets. Pets. That's, I always say there's three Ps, people, parking, and pets, and that the number one is always pets. I can believe that. <laughs> so the issue becomes... You know, boards want to establish rules for pets, maybe even so you can't have pets. Can they do that? They can as long as they are reflected in the bylaws of the association. Um, they can say pets are allowed, pets are not allowed. They can indicate how many pets. Um, I've seen bylaws that says you're allowed a cat or a dog, but not both. You know, it, it varies from association to association. So the key document is the bylaws. Yes. And that's an official recorded document of the association. And so if they say you may have pets or maybe even restrictions on pets or you cannot have pets, can the board establish house rules that are contrary to the bylaws? That actually happens more often than not where an association does allow pets. Maybe they have very good write-up in the bylaws in regards to those pets and then somewhere along the line they decide to change the rules and in the house rules they say no pets allowed. If they haven't changed that in the bylaws, the bylaws are the governing document. So the bylaws will supersede those house rules and pets would still be allowed. So in order to change that they would have to amend their bylaws. And that's going to take 67 percent of the owners to yes. vote either by written consent or by at a meeting to change the bylaws to change the pet restrictions. And so what happens if all of a sudden they decided to go from a pet friendly building to a non-pet friendly building and you happen to have a dog? Well I've actually had that happen a couple of times with friends who own condos in, in pet friendly uh, buildings where the board did decide to change the bylaws and now no longer allow pets. Those people who had pets before the bylaws were changed are grandfathered in. What's more interesting about that is say you were grandfathered in, you had your little chihuahua, and the chihuahua passes away. Are you allowed to replace that pet now that the bylaws have been changed? And the answer is... I'm waiting for your answer. Oh, okay. I thought I gave it to you. Uh, the answer is yes, they can continue to replace that animal as long as they live there. But the day they sell that unit, the person buying that unit doesn't have that right. They have to abide by what's in the bylaws now. Well, it sounds interesting on pets because, you know, people sometimes seek pet-friendly buildings yes. because maybe they're afraid of dogs or they're allergic to pet hair, whatever it may be. So, you know, it's not really right for the board to try to, through the house rules, make changes that are contrary to the bicycle. Yep, that's exactly right. And it's very important for a buyer if they're looking for a condo that is 
that they can have Fifi, their poodle, or whatever they have, it's important that they read those documents and understand whether or not they're going to be allowed to have that particular animal there or not. I read an article recently about pets, and we were talking about uh, when they boards have put like size restrictions mm -hmm. on pets or quantity, a number of pets. And a lot of it comes back to people's phobia. To, like big dogs, are, they make people afraid, right? Not everybody, but some people are afraid. Where I was looking at an American Kennel Association uh, article, and they were saying that the better way to do it is to define breeds of dogs that are not available to be have in the, in the building. Could and be. there's actually house rules and where they have a pet-friendly building where I've seen them say that certain dog breeds are not allowed mm -hmm. because they're considered a little more aggressive than other breeds. But uh, I think the key for our listeners would be to understand that if the bylaws say you can have bets or not have bets, you can't set up house rules to alter that, although you could set up house rules probably if it allows pets to say you only allowed one dog or two dogs or and they can't be over 50 pounds or whatever on that line. They could, they could modify uh, the restriction to make it more just more correct for their building. I think what's important too to understand is that some of these bylaws are fairly old. Maybe the building was built in the 70s or 80s and they did allow pets but the pet rule in the bylaws may be vague in itself. Right. And it might be time to take a look at that and see is do the bylaws need amendment for that. I saw one association built in the early 80s um, where the restriction was you can have pets as long as it doesn't exceed 30 pounds. Well, the way that was written, I could have a whole bunch of three or four pound teacup chihuahuas before I hit that 30 pound restriction. I right. didn't have it written so that it applied to one animal. It just said pets are allowed and then a 30 pound restriction. So it might be a good idea even now to take a look at your bylaws and make sure that it is clear. Yeah, in yeah, public gathering documents should be reviewed every 10 years or so yeah. to make sure they meet the current standards of the, of the building. But the other thing that always comes up, you know, is the famous service, assistance, and emotional support therapy animals. I know you're an expert on that <laughs> nationally. <laughs> and we only have 28 minutes. We have three more topics to cover. Can, can you just talk a little bit about that? Real quickly, as quickly as I can, um, first there's two big distinctions there. Number one, a service animal under federal law is a properly trained dog for whatever your disability is, or a properly trained miniature horse, which is usually the size of a, of a large dog. That is all the Disability Act recognizes as a service animal. But even when they clarified that back uh, a few years ago, they also pointed out that does not change the rules under federal fair housing, person with a disability, and an emotional support animal. Emotional support animal has often been referred to as any common domestic animal. So it could be a dog, it could be a cat, it could be a bird. And even if the association does not have, has a rule that says no pets are allowed, and you have an emotional support animal, they have to make reasonable accommodations, as it's called, to allow you to have that animal. Sadly, though, I think it's been, uh, and you and I have talked about this before, that it's being abused quite a bit in regards to this emotional so, so support. So what can a board ask a, bo uh, a person, they say, I need this emotional support kangaroo that uh, <laughs> we, did, we did a show on this. We had yes, pictures of I mean, there's emotional support, snakes, chickens, kangaroos, you name it. And I qualified for an emotional support elephant when I did my online application. But the reality is, what can they ask? What can the boards ask? The board cannot ask what your disability is. That's first big no-no, nor can they ask for any medical documents. Um, all you, the person who has the issue needs to provide is a document, a letter, um, signed by a medical professional indicating that they have a disability that requires them to have this emotional support animal. The sad thing is, and you found out this on your own just trying to get your emotional support pygmy elephant approved, is that a lot of people just go online, pay a fee, ask a few questions, and boom, they've got a letter supposedly signed by a medical professional. Yeah, and what we had is where it was on the news recently about Hawaii Kai, and you were, I think, interviewed on the news. There was a, uh, I think it was a lady, but a person who had uh, two chickens. Two emotional support chickens. Yes. Um, and we're still trying to, 
get clarification from the state, uh, at least the, um, in regards to whether or not those are actually valid. Because the law is fairly vague on what animals could be considered. Um, and, you know, the poor board is trying to understand what their rights are as a running the association and what the person's rights are as a person with a possible disability. Um, you did mention snakes. I would, however, like to point out that in some states an emotional support animal snake is okay, but not in Hawaii. It cannot be an illegal animal. So at least we don't have to worry about somebody showing up with their emotional support boa constrictor. Well, I saw a property manager, they had a picture of a townhouse project and the person had a, a brand new goat <laughs> and the goat was running free in the common areas uh -huh. and they captured it but they got pictures of it running free in the common areas and when they asked about it it became went from a pet to an emotional support goat yes you know and I guess the point I'd like to make before we move on off the pet side of it is the bylaws rule mm -hmm. number one but number two we certainly respect the rights of the disabled and want any legitimate disabled person to be able to have those things that make their life better well, and we also to clarify, like the goat issue you just brought up, you can have what is called reasonable restrictions. And running loose in the common area would not be deemed reasonable or an accommodation. So you could have rules like they must be leashed, they must be licensed, and you must pick up after them. Those are reasonable rules according to Federal Fair Housing. But the legislation we've seen in the past on this has been focused on the medical, the medical yes. certifier if they were to falsely certify someone needing it, uh, that they would be a misdemeanor. You know, I think that's what they did in California or some other states. California we, and Florida. And Florida, because it's become such an issue that people can use that because of your limited ability to ask questions to try to get around the bylaws that say no pets. Lastly, it's only happened in the last year, maybe two years, but if you look at older documents and older articles, they talked about the fact that multiple animals have not been an issue. Well, they now have started to become an issue where there have been instances where people are claiming five different animals as their emotional support in a non-pet rental or a non-pet condominium. And so it's getting pretty yeah. hairy. Well, I had a mediation with a person that had two dogs, but the second dog was the emotional support animal for the dog. So they were saying, we need two because my one emotional support dog gets lonely and so we have to have an emotional support dog for the dog, you know. So it's a complex matter, but it is. for what we can talk about today, I think what's important, the boards need to know they can't create house rules that violate the bylaws with regard to pets. And number two, if they have an issue on uh, service animals or emotional support animals, I suggest they talk to their attorney because there are big penalties if you falsely yep. take action on that. And, and I would be the first to admit that the laws are gray and maybe, are. Not, maybe not always fair. So let's take something since you brought the three P's up. The other was parking. Yes. So I'm an owner and you're an owner in a, a condominium. And uh, because of whatever reason, I want your parking stall and you want my parking stall. And so that's different than the declaration. So, you know, 67% owner vote, theoretically, would be required to amend the declaration. Is that true on swapping parking stalls? No, it's not true on parking, um, parking stalls. And in our case, my first reaction to you would be, how much are you willing to pay me monthly for that my parking stall? But that's just between you and I. <laughs> that's true. But I think the point is that the owners on their own could go and get a lawyer yes. to write up an amendment to the declaration, swapping the parking stalls, signed and notarized and recorded by both parties. And all that the owner has to do is to give a copy to the board of directors. Mm -hmm. The board can't interfere with the simple swapping of a parking stall. I would like to point out though, um, if it's involving a disability, the association does need to take steps to make reasonable accommodation in regards to parking as far as they're able to. But that's another show in itself as well. Yeah, well, yeah, it's interesting. I saw a case where an owner who was disabled wanted to demand that another owner had to swap stalls. Mm -hmm. And they couldn't do that, they couldn't get away. But the association had to make reasonable accommodations to the extent that the guest parking or the area near the elevator, that they were allowed them to park there for 15 minutes while they unloaded their groceries. Or they had to make accommodations to try to make their life easier. 
That owner, after they couldn't get the owner to be forced to swap calls, wanted the association to be forced to give up a guest parking stall in exchange for their stall. Well, guest parking stalls are at the entrance on the first level and yeah. they're certified, and they, they weren't able to get the Civil Rights Commission to support that either because the board was willing to make accommodations. You can use the parking stall when you have a, a provider to come take care of you for you know your own personal mm -hmm. assistance, or B, you can park there while you unload your go -sees. The board was willing to give them temporary um, permanent away, they could do it forever, accommodations, but they couldn't force the exchange of the real yes. property, which was owned by the association as, quote, 100 owners, so they couldn't force that. And I think the key there, too, is it's got to be a reasonable accommodation. You know, sometimes they can, the request can be unreasonable and or highly expensive for the association, too, so those factors do come into play. Yeah, so on parking, just to kind of sum that up, owners among, among their own choices between owners, can swap parking stalls at their own expense and just notify the board. The board really has no standing on it. And uh, certainly um, when they do that, they should make sure it's recorded because they want that to follow up yep. on. Uh, I have seen owners who um, say, you use my stall, I use your stall. They just did it as an accommodation and didn't bother to change the deed, saying that maybe a future buyer wouldn't want that. So. As an alternative to spending all the money with the lawyers and recording it, they could just say, I'll park in yours, you park in mine, and, and, and handle it that way. I actually see it quite often where, oh, your car is smaller than my car, and my car would fit better in there, you want to swap. And that, that's just a simple swap for a temporary period yeah. of time. Well, I think we're up for a break right now, and we have two more topics to go through after the break. So thank all of you for watching Condo Insider. We'll be right back in a minute. Aloha, my name is Justine Espiritu. This is my co-host Matthew Johnson. Every Thursday at 4 p.m. on ThemeTech, we host the Hawaii Food and Farmer Series. We like to bring in folks from the whole realm of the local food supply and agriculture, anyone working on these issues, any organization or individual that has plans or projects. What kind of people have we had on? Uh, so we've had farmers, we've had chefs, we've had people from government, uh, larger institutions, everyone who's working to help make Hawaii's local food system that much better. So you can see us every Thursday and join the conversation on Twitter, and we hope to see you there. Welcome back to Kind of Insider. We're sitting here with Scott Shirley, summarizing finally of six, after six long weeks, <laughs> Kind of Mini and 514B and Common Issues. To keep on our schedule because it's my, I'm going to call it my good riddance stay for Scott. <laughs> I see you at the office. I see you here. I'm getting nightmares. So, you know, You're getting nightmares. Well. I know. I understand your feelings. <laughs> anyway, smoking in condos, the big debate. There were two bills before the legislature. Neither one of them moved on, so they died all talking about smoking in condos. So... What can the board do about smoking in condos? Well, and it's become, this issue about smoking has become right up there with the pets issue. Um, and a lot of condos, actually for the last few years, have been taking their own initiative by um, amending their bylaws, making themselves a smoke-free property, um, where they actually take a vote. And surprisingly enough, they get more than 67% to respond in regards to smoking issues. And they make their entire property a smoke-free environment. And I think a lot of the newer projects that are being built are already incorporating that in there because, you know, smoking is such a bad habit. Um, we do already have um, statute that we can lean on in certain other areas, like the no state no smoking law says that you cannot smoke in any common area, um, hallways, elevators, association office, um, and I believe in 2015 they added electronic cigarettes as a um, tobacco product, so anywhere you're not allowed to smoke a regular cigarette, and you're not allowed to smoke an uh, electronic cigarette Can't either. can vape, as they say. Yes, uh, you know. although I follow behind cars where they're vaping in the car, and I think I'm in a Cheech and Chong movie or the car's on fire. Yes, <laughs> I, I have to say that feeling. But let's kind of go back to just generally on smoking. It's clear in the state law that you can't have smoking in the common area. So by the pool, the elevators, the lobby, the, the boards just have the right to enforce no smoking. In fact, it's a state law, they have an obligation to smoke. Yes. The next area that has always been controversial is Lanai's. 
in some cases, the lanai's are common elements, and in some cases, they're part of the apartment in the Declaration. But I've always referred to, I don't like the word smoking. I like the word noxious odors. I agree with you. Because it could be incense or something else that's flowing into another apartment causing uh, allergy or disruption. So what do you feel, feel about smoking on the knives? Well, that, you're right. It has been a bit of a controversy in regards to that because the statute says common areas and some attorneys will point out, well, the lanai is a limited common area for your use only, so you should be allowed to smoke on there. So I think your take, which I've agreed with, surprisingly, uh, is that the noxious fumes issue. A lot of these condos don't allow you to have an open flame barbecue on your lanai. Well, isn't it sort of the same thing? You're billowing smoke, or especially if you're vaping on your lanai, it's going into other units and, and bothering other people. Yeah, most of the lawyers I know, it's not uniform, so I don't want to yeah. be telling our viewers that this is the rule you should take, but you should check with your lawyer. But most believe you can restrict, under today's law, smoking on lanai's if the smoke travels into another person's mm -hmm. unit. And so that smoking on the lanai's can be done without amending the declaration. Yes. If you want to have a non-smoking building, that means you can't smoke in the unit, that takes a amendment to 67 percent of the of the condos to uh, to do that and some of the condos that I've seen that have done that they've gotten anywhere from 80 85 percent response rate right. to doing that so you know the issue about smoking is very high on a lot of people's yeah. list it's interesting from I'm, and I'm not saying I'm right but my experience says this and that is that we see more resistance to um, smoking and, or allowing smoking. Mm -hmm. It's the resort properties that they have a lot of vacation yes. rentals. And so they don't want to have guests being restricted. So they're more inclined. Although hotels today have non-smoking rooms. Yes, and, they do. And certainly the owner of a condo can say, I only take non-smoking guests, you know, so or, or tenants as it may be. You know, so uh, I think that we, we've tried to get the legislature to really clarify that in the law, but uh, to date we have what we have and the boards have to look at that and say, uh, is it a problem in our building, smoking on the knives? Yeah. If so, let's check with our lawyer what we can do. Because oftentimes they'll set up a smoking area down in one corner where the winds don't blow and say, yeah. uh, we're having a non-smoking building, but we have a little smoking area in the corner, northwest corner of the property. To, right next uh, to the dumpster. Right next to the dumpster, <laughs> right. You know, but somewhere so they can accommodate those people. But in the end, if they want to make it a non-smoking building, they have to amend the bylaws or and that's 67 percent. I think one of the things that an association should realize is there is statute, there is laws and rules in regards to smoking, so there is options out there for the association right. to take. And how about marijuana? We have a marijuana law. Do? No. no. <laughs> and today is 420, I believe. Yes, it is. Yeah, I went to military college. I'm a, I'm a clean guy. <laughs> well, as you know, Hawaii is one of those states that allow um, medical use of marijuana and that has become an issue with condo associations, homeowners associations, even with long-term rentals and the state has stepped up to the plate in regards to this as well. You can't stop somebody from using their medical marijuana but if the building has a no smoking policy and you partake of your medical marijuana by way of smoking, you can stop the smoking part meaning they're still allowed to take medical marijuana, they're just not allowed to smoke it. So they can ingest it or some yeah. other method. Edibles of, or something. Edible, like yeah, right. So, And I think we're probably going to have to face the issue sooner or later that Hawaii may end up becoming eventually a recreational state as well, like Colorado. Um, and if you think of the tax benefits of that, we might be able to finish rail if they do that. Well, we don't have time today. <laughs> we have some very interesting bills on... Uh, for example, allowing owners to smoke, but tenants not to smoke. And oh, yes, that. I saw that so one. There's a couple of bills out there, but it's an area I think boards have to think about and, yeah. and uh, poll their owners what they want and look at their use, like the vacation rental building versus the regular building, and make policy realizing common areas, they don't have a choice. Well, now, as they may have a choice. Yes. And if they want to prevent it in the, bill, in the apartment, they've got to amend their declaration and, or excuse me, their bylaws to create a non-smoking And some building. of them are going to that extent. So oh, it happens all the time. Yeah. It happens all the time. And then they have to deal with the person who says, I've been smoking and now I'm having withdrawals. So you've created a medical problem for me and I'm going to create all this 
you, you might be surprised to know that under the Americans with Disabilities Act, nicotine addiction is considered a disability. However, that doesn't give you the right to smoke a cigarette. It just means you have protections if you are in recovery, meaning right. you're not smoking anymore. Oh, cool. So finally, because we've done our last few minutes of the show, <laughs> my favorite topic is do owners have rights if they want to complain to resolve a dispute? And what rights do they kind of have in general terms? And I know all the years that I've known you, or at least admitted to knowing you, um, this has been a, a big topic for you, one that you're very much in favor of in regards to having mediation and, and trying to resolve problems. Yeah, I think the way I look at this is that it's like a fulcrum where you want to balance between the association's needs and the owner's rights. Yes. And so you have a dispute. The way that some of the laws are today, they really favor the association more and limit even due process for homeowners. It's mm -hmm. like the board says this, you've got to pay the fine, whatever it may be. Well, the law specifically provides today for mandatory mediation. You have a right to go to mediation, and the board has a mandatory obligation to attend. Yeah. In 19, let's see, 2015, they gave a second type of mediation called a valuative mediation, which is before retired judges who can take the gloves off and be more like a settlement conference person exactly. to do the mediation. And it's been quite effective. So what we need the viewers to know and boards to know is that homeowners have a right to either facilitate or evaluate a mediation to the law. It says shall go to mediation, which means you have no reason not to go to mediation. A current bill before the legislature, which probably won't pass in its current form, but says it's a breach of your fiduciary duty if you don't go to mediation, which means your insurance won't cover you because it's an automatic breach yep. of not showing up for mediation. And then the statute further provides for something called non-binding arbitration, mm -hmm. which is really used because why spend all the money with a formality of arbitration if it's not binding? But Act 187, if it gets amended this year, will allow parties to agree to non-binding arbitration or evaluative arbitration where the judge issues an opinion. And the good thing about that, each side only pays $175, and the condominium education fund uh, covers all the rest of the costs. I think that's a, another key right there is this is also a less expensive way to resolve your problem than everybody hiring their attorneys and spending thousands and thousands right. of dollars trying to resolve something that could have been actually easily taken care of through mediation. And for clarification, the cost of this mediator, arbitrator, is paid through the Continuing Education yes. Fund. There's certain rules on it. But if you want to hire your own attorney, you've got to pay for your own attorney. They don't pay for your yep. attorney. You know? Yeah, you still have the right if you want to bring your attorney with you, but and you pay for that cost, not the association or not that fund. And I would encourage all boards and all owners to try just to go to an executive session and work out their problems before they yep. get into this process. But the law does give owners that right, and boards need to know. It says shall, and that doesn't mean it's optional. That's it means right. they should go, and, and they have to go. So on that note, we're at the end of our show. I can't believe it. We got through the whole thing this time. I know. 514B <laughs> is pow. You know, we'll have more interesting topics next week about association living. Yes. But you're a good friend for many, many years, and your wife is too, Penny. She has bad taste in men, but she's a, a wonderful lady. I know what my best asset is. Let's yeah. put it that way. Yeah. So. <laughs> so anyway, I just want to thank you for coming for six weeks in a row and all you've contributed over the years to the industry. And I welcome you back as a co-host with me over time. And, and thank you, Scott Shirley, for being a part of the show. And to all our viewers, we're powerful this week. Condo Insider, come back next Thursday at 3 o'clock. And we are always welcome to call with questions. Aloha.